pledge allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. item on the agenda is approval of requisitions for um, uh, for March 21st. I'll move we approve requisitions for March 21st, 2019 in the amount of 152000 Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Is there a discussion? Hearing none. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Um, uh, approval of counts payable for um, March 14th and I'll move approval of the accounts payable March 14th 2019 $141,501.68 okay. I'll second it is there discussion hearing none all in favor signify by saying aye aye, aye. opposed approval of uh, accounts payable for March 21st and the amount of, uh, of that is uh, $471,104.43, and I'll move that. Second. Moved and seconded. Is there discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Manual checks for March 15th. I move approval of manual checks March 15, 2019, total amount $71,873.85. Second. Is there discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And uh, uh, manual checks for March 22nd. Uh, um, do we have it? I move we approve manual checks for March 22nd, 2019. Dated March 21st in the check register in the amount of $338,069.81. Second. Is there discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And uh, down to payroll for March 7th. And I move we approve payroll for March 7th, 2019 in the amount of $268,172.85. Second. Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Well, it's, it's absolutely my pleasure and honor to be able to recognize some Eagle Scouts that are here with us in the audience, I believe. Um, we have some uh, <laughs> certificates for them, and um, I'm going to just Thank you. I know this isn't this is not an easy thing to accomplish. It takes a lot of work, and and I don't think I've ever seen so many Eagle Scouts names on one sheet of paper before. So um, this is the Shenandoah Area Council. Um, I'm gonna, uh, and this is from Mr. David Boron. Uh, he's the Potomac uh, District's Eagle Scout Recognition Coordinator. Uh, the Potomac District serves three counties in West Virginia, Berkeley, Morgan, and Jefferson. We are part of the Shenandoah Area Council, which is headquartered in Winchester, Virginia. I have several boys from Jefferson County who, heard their, who earned their Eagle rank and, in 2018, and uh, we're here this evening to recognize them and to present them with a certificate. So um, I have the names of them here. I'm going to call them out, and as I do, I would like you to come up and just line up in front of, the, in front of us, and uh, we'll hand out those certificates. Um, from Jefferson County, uh, Troop 6, Joshua Hernandez, Thaddeus Lejowick, Harrison Spencer, Kevin Blankenship, <laughs> Jonathan Wilfred, and, that, and now we're to Troop 33, Owen Stein. Louis Babnitz, Troop 42, Ian Bird, Troop 420, uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, and Jackson Stewart, uh, Troop 421, Eric McClaffin, 
Troop 948, Nicholas Chapman, William Connolly, Matthew Schaefer. <coughs> just have to find it. That's right. Here we are. Congratulations, Matthew. Thank you. Well done. So do you want to stand here just for a minute? Um, Austin Weller. Great. Congratulations, Austin. Thank you. Well done. Um, that, is, that concludes the number of, uh, of uh, folks or, or Boy, uh, Eagle Scouts that we have to recognize this evening. We, ha we do have, Mr. Warren, are you here? Is there anyone here to represent uh, their, do you have any your parents or, or, can you take, will you see those, will you see any of the other? Eagle Scout. Um, yes. I'm the vice president of membership for the Shenandoah County. Okay. Or Shenandoah Area Council. I'll, I'll get them. To Wonderful. Them. I'm gonna I'm gonna hand these to you then, or you can want to pick them up later. No, okay. Great. Well, I just want to commend you for all the work, the hard work that you've done to attain the level that you've achieved, and it's a it's a wonderful accomplishment, and you deserve a lot of congratulations. So we have each uh, the gentleman tell us what their project was. I think that'd be awesome. Yeah. Do you want to speak into the microphone and tell us what your project was? <laughs> yes, that one's great. Yeah. My name is Austin Weller. I'm from Troop 948. My equal project, I built 10 picnic tables for C.W. Shipley for them to put around their track that they recently made. Awesome. My name is Matthew Schaefer. I'm from Troop 948 also. And I built 10 benches for the fair. So we're going to have you come over here. We're going to take an opportunity to uh, have, a, have a picture with you and your certificates. Come on around this way. See, we've got the great seal of Jefferson County. You get in the middle. <laughs> And next, we're going to go to the financial director's report. Is Michelle here? Yeah. Oh, there she is. Okay. Before we look at the budget revisions, I had to, I wanted to clarify a couple of dates and in public session with you. Um, the public hearing to lay the levy rate for fiscal year 20 will be held on April the 16th at 9.30 a.m. Um, wanted to confirm that April the 17th at 6 p.m. is an okay date for everyone here for the public hearing to modify the service fee ordinance for ambulance fees. What, what time is that? 6 p.m. And you said April? April 17th. Okay, the next day. Yeah. All right. And then for the excise fee or the uh, property transfer tax, we are actually required to provide 30 days public notice before we actually have the meeting date for that. So I'm looking at May the 2nd, uh, which is a regular 
session date, and I wanted to make sure that that would be okay for the public hearing date for the property transfer tax. And we'll just work that into the schedule on that date. The 2nd of May. 1.30? Yeah, that's good. Do we want to have that in the evening? Because it is property tax rate increase. Most people are at work at 1.30. I mean, not property tax, transfer tax. I mean, I feel like that should be an evening public hearing. Yes. I'm not opposed to it being the evening. I think it just makes sense. Right. I mean, most people are in work, so. What, 6 p.m.? Not most, but a lot are. Oh. A lot of people who may want to come are. Yeah. <coughs> do you want to do it on May the 2nd, or would you rather do that two weeks later in the evining, at the evening session? Let's do it in the evening yeah. session. Can we wait Two weeks long? later. Yeah. Yeah, we, okay. we just... Um, as long as we have 30 days notice and not more than 60 days notice, we're fine. Okay. That would that be the 16th. Works. The 16th, yes. At uh, 7, at, well, we'll work it into the schedule. Probably 7, as we seven. get everything before. Yeah. I have two budget revisions for you to approve. First one is an internal budget revision uh, presented to me from the assessor. Uh, she would like to transfer money within her department from uh, printing to travel and record books, a uh, $1,000 transfer. That, that's all within her current budget. It's just switching line items around. Correct. Yeah. I move that we approve internal budget revision number two. Second. Okay. okay. It's been moved and seconded. Is there discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? All right. And the next budget revision is the state budget revision. It's made up of a number of components. Let me get there. <laughs> yeah, I see that. <clears throat> okay. The first portion of it is um, to remove the budget for ambulance fees out of the general fund and establish it in the uh, separate uh, ambulance service fee fund per the uh, audit that we had in fiscal year 16 were required to move that out of the general fund. So that one is pretty much budget neutral. Okay. <clears throat> the second portion is to uh, transfer a position back from IT back into the maintenance department that a particular employee never actually transferred to the IT department, therefore his uh, salary expenditure is, is in maintenance, so we need to transfer that funds back. <clears throat> uh, the third portion is to revise our revenue projection for hotel occupancy mm -hmm. tax and related distributions to parks and rec, uh, arts and humanities, the historic landmarks commission and CVB by about $42,400. That one is budget neutral also. Uh, third portion is to allocate health insurance increase to department. It does have a little bit of a deficit. We did budget for that. However, the deficit was caused by employees who may have changed during the fiscal year. So this is to bring it to department's whole. Uh, for their um, budget increase in fiscal year 19. Next portion are fees associated with a one-time expense that we received from <clears throat> the state retirement system. Apparently a number of years ago our payroll clerk many many years ago didn't always set up retirement deductions on the employees date of hire and therefore we received uh, some uh, past due notices on from several departments. So this is to make those departments whole on those past due notices. And then the last portion is just revising um, revenues and expenditures based on historical trends so far for fiscal year 19. The biggest items of note are increases to revenues for gas and oil severance, uh, decreasing the 911 fees by $200,000. Um, just based on history so far this year, increasing charges for services, miscellaneous revenue and refunds and reimbursements, primarily due to the sheriff's office billing for services, for security services. Um, the biggest items of note for expenditure increases are a $90,000 increase in uh, county commission's professional services for litigation related to um, a number of items. Um, we also saw an increase in our unemployment insurance that was not expected. 
The other amounts are fairly small until we get down to other buildings. Electricity, um, I did ask Bill if there was um, something going on with electricity, and I believe it may have been um, unbudgeted amounts for the acquisition of the uh, prosecuting attorney's office building mm -hmm. or unexpected budget amount for that. So that's why there's a $55,000 decrease there. Um, law enforcement overtime has a $110,000 increase primarily due to the security services that he is able to provide for other um, organizations and he's able to bill that out. Um, he is also able to offset that slightly by reducing his bailiff and uh, wages. So he's, and um, there's also an increase in his auto supplies for 28,000 due to unexpected repairs associated with uh, automobile accidents is primarily deer. Um, he, it's not completely budget neutral for his right. department, but he is, he is trying to offset it as much as he can. And then the last big one would be an increase of $30,000 based on historical trends for our fuel costs in yeah. our central garage. Uh, I would recommend funding this uh, with that 160000 for from our contingency for emergencies. We haven't used any of that year to date. We're already uh, almost at in April, so I would recommend reducing that by 160000 and the rest would be from fund balance of about $30,000. Any questions about any of those? The allocation of the anticipated legal expenses, what's the rough number we're allocating for that? Uh, we need an additional $90,000. I don't remember the total amount off the top of my head. I'm just looking for a ballpark. I want to say it was about 120, 130,000. Any other questions? So um, I'll, I'll move that we approve uh, state budget revision number one. Is it one? No, it's four. It's four. It's number four. Yeah, it's four. Here it is. Yeah. <coughs> uh, is there discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? A second? Yeah, um, <coughs> we did have a second, I think. I'll second it. Okay. I thought I heard a second, but I didn't know who did it. Let's have you sign these two pages real quick. So uh, I'm going to move Roger Goodwin uh, from number nine on the agenda up to number uh, right after number two. So um, I just want to make that announcement. And Sandy, do you have any other announcements for us? I do not. You took care of that one. Thank you. Okay. I just have one thing, Mr. President. Okay. Uh, number 11 is mine, student liaison to JCC. I'm willing to hold off on that until next meeting just okay. for time purposes. And uh, just one other general comment. I feel like public comment has been shrinking slower and slower each time. Mm -hmm. Now it looks like it's only 20 minutes. I don't think we should uh, be restricting public comment. I know you don't, um, but we have a busy agenda. We have a lot on the agenda this evening. So we can stick to that. I'd like my fellow commissioners to chime in on that if okay, possible. Okay, that's fine. Absolutely. Go ahead. Well, let me ask Josh, do you have a time that you would recommend? I mean, we work for them. If they want to talk, let them talk. Well, I, I mean, I, I, I recognize maybe portion up front and then take care of general business, but if people are still here and want to talk, we should let them talk. Well, here, here's my concern. We have staff that have been here since 9 o'clock this morning. They have had a long day, and uh, so, you know, I, I don't have a problem. I said general with business. Take do a little well, portion I understand what you're saying, but business. they still have to stay because they have to close everything up. So it doesn't make it doesn't help them. So I mean, as, I'm gonna unless there's objection. As from far as I'm concerned, I mean we work for the taxpayers. I We're know. here to support them. Like, just listen to them. Thank you. Thank you. But, how do I put it? 
my other commissioners feel. Does anyone object to, to the schedule the way it is? It's, uh, I agree. I think if they want to speak, they should speak. Well, and I don't have a problem with that. But I don't have a problem with that. Well, let's see, you got 20 minutes. I, I would say at least 30 minutes before we go on to business and finish. Okay, yeah. 30 minutes. Uh, uh, let's try that and That's see if fine. we get through more. I'm okay with that. So we'll increase it to, instead of for uh, uh, 640, we'll do uh, 620, uh, 650. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we're... Um, At public comment so we have a few people signed up and uh, the first person on the list is Jane Tab. Yes I was unlocking the door when the sign-up sheet was put down and I plan to sign first and so if you will give me some leeway here this will be quick. I received a robo call on Monday as I'm sure many of you have as well. The robo caller referred to me, Commissioner Jane Tabb, as an extreme environmentalist. I believe you could say that is in the eye of the beholder. I am concerned about the air quality of the Rockwell plant and have hired a consultant with my own money to study the issue. I have a very personal interest in this topic. I have two grandchildren at T.A. Lowry. Next year I'll have another one, and the year after that I'll have another one. So I'll have four there. Uh, the robo-caller robo also said that I had filed lawsuits that impacted funding for the fire departments and the sheriff. That is totally false. I have filed no lawsuits either personally or as a commissioner. I am on the Fire and Rescue Association, the Emergency Services Agency, the E911 Board, and the Homeland Security Steering Committee. I have worked tirelessly to secure funding for all the critical services needed in our county within the constraints of our budget. A positive outcome of this situation is that I have received more positive comments than negative. So thank you. As an elected official, I will not agree with everyone and welcome debate and new viewpoints. Using the facts leads to an honest discussion that benefits everyone. Thank you. Good evening. I'm on. Um, as a taxpaying constituent, I would like to know your legal justification for keeping a financial agreement with a foreign corporation secret from your constituents until you sign it. I don't see anything that could be secret about this. There are no corporate secrets in here. What you're doing is giving away future tax revenue to a foreign corporation. You're not buying their corporate or proprietary secrets. You snuck this onto the agenda after the agenda was published for tonight's meeting. Even though you insist on keeping the pilot agreement secret, the fact you are to discuss it this evening was not published with adequate notice to the public. It appears you are close to violating the Open Meetings Act by taking an action on an item that was not properly noticed. And this is the real heart of my comment. Do any of you have any idea who owns TEMA? Anybody? It's not a publicly traded corporation in Italy. It's not on the Italian Stock Exchange. There is no record of the ownership that I can find. Um, there's no mention of the ownership on the TEMA website. I may be old-fashioned, but I believe you and we need to know who is going to benefit from our largesse when it is bestowed upon them. I believe due diligence demands you know with whom you are dealing. Unless you know the ownership of the of structure of TEMA, can you really sign the pilot, which I assume will contain the same bo boilerplate assurances as the Rockwell pilot? And this is what that said. The commission hereby represents, warrants, agrees, finds, and confirms its findings that the commission has found and hereby finds that the agreements herein contained and the consummation of the transactions in connection herewith will promote the public interest and public purposes by, among other things, 
providing certainty and soundness in fiscal planning, and promoting present and prospective prosperity, health, happiness, safety, and general welfare of the people of Jefferson County. Make sure, please, that you have found and hereby find before you sign this thing. In Bacario. I'm Lynn Bocchiaro, and this evening um, I would like to read an article that was written by Tracy Danzi of Shepherdstown, a 40-year West Virginia resident, and it will be appearing in the Charleston Gazette Mail. She couldn't be here this evening to read it. It's called Surviving West Virginia. West Virginia, I love you, but I barely survived you. It's time that we ask ourselves if the act of simply surviving this state is enough. Is surviving West Virginia the best that we can do? Is this what we call a success story? Heavy industry and natural resource extraction has poisoned our waters, polluted our air, and stripped our land. Let's be honest about that for a minute. We are all impacted as citizens of this state. I myself am a victim of DuPont. I was raised in Parkersburg, West Virginia, where DuPont dumped C8, a Teflon byproduct, directly into our waterways while holding solid evidence that C8 was making humans and animals sick. I was a competitive swimmer. I spent all my developmental years in those waters. In 2001, at age 21, I lost the function of my thyroid, a known effect of C8 exposure. In 2005, at age 25, I was diagnosed with an atypical form of osteosarcoma, bone cancer, of my right hip, the same rare disease that had taken the life of my childhood dog five years earlier. I had an amputation of my right hip and leg and underwent high-dose chemotherapy treatments for 18 months. My gluteus maximus is now sewn to my abdominal muscles so that my internal organs can't escape my body. I walk on forearm crutches. I fall frequently. My life is not easy, but I never forget that I'm one of the lucky ones. I survived. I deserved more from you, West Virginia. I deserved better. In the eastern panhandle, my more recent home, a war is raging. Jefferson County, the wealthiest county in West Virginia, has no existing heavy industry. The area boasts a strong economy of tourism, agriculture, education, government, and light manufacturing. We have fresh air and clean water. It serves as a haven and retreat within the greater Washington, D.C. metro area. Rough Wool, previously Roxel, a Danish mineral wool insulation corporation, is fighting to establish itself there. It wasn't until four months after the agreements were signed by county and municipal officials that Rock Wool applied for an air pollution permit. It was then, for the first time, Rock Wool disclosed their intent to emit 156,000 tons of air pollutants annually in a county whose heaviest emitter produces only 18 pounds of air pollutants annually. The West Virginia DEP approved the air permit despite discovery that Rockwell's models were highly flawed and their risks improperly represented. Additionally, Jefferson County's unique geology puts the area's water at risk without the possibility of remediation. Thank you. The next person to speak is Karen Glennon. I'm going to finish Tracy's letter to us. Jim Cummings, a retired biologist with the Interstate Commission on the Potomac River Basin, states, quote, Rockwell could not have picked a more vulnerable site, end quote. Although the majority of local municipalities, public officials, and citizens now openly impose the project, an apathetic West Virginia mentality persists in some integral portions, um, excuse me, positions of power. In a March 19, 2019 Martinsburg Journal article, Jefferson County Commission President Patsy Nolan talked about growing up near Powhatan Brass Foundry and Victor Products, both long gone industries of the area. She continued, quote, I survived growing up in that area along with a lot of my friends who also survived. We obviously know more today than we did back then, but I lived through that era and survived. To address Patsy Nolan directly, I say, it's lovely that you survived, but many of your fellow West Virginians did not. Not all of us have come out whole on the other side. 
Insensitivity to this fact in a public servant is appalling. West Virginia can do better. This state can offer our children more than just the possibility of survival. If we know better, we must do better. West Virginia's apathy towards its people who have suffered and died as a result of polluting industries is inexcusable. Health and prosperity in West Virginia need not be mutually exclusive. Turn your investments toward the future rather than the past. Surviving West Virginia shouldn't be your prize. Truly living within her should be. My name is Kira Young and I live on the border of Frederick County, Virginia and Berkeley County, West Virginia on Back Creek. Uh, for the past 20 years I've been leading interfaith prayers in communities of crisis and um, now I'm going to do it here. So if you um, would just indulge me and understand that at the core of every single religion is, is the knowing that all life is sacred and all that depends, uh, all that feeds life and all that life depends on is sacred too. So our water and our air is also sacred because nothing can live without it and life is sacred. So, Great Spirit, Mother Earth, Father Sky, Four Directions, Ancestors, thank you for our lives. Thank you for our relationships. Thank you for coming together here with us today. So decisions together that will affect generations to come. Thank you for the moral authority of this board. Thank you for the moral authority of the people. Thank you for considering our children's 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 children. Thank you for considering the natural communities that also retain the same right to life that we do. Thank you. I'd like to use my time. I'd like to use my time to invite everyone in this room to rise and quietly consider how we individually and collectively can act to protect the health of all our community. Please rise.
Thank you. No Grant Prelliman. No Grant Prelliman. Good evening. My name is Grant Prilliman. I'm a 30-year resident of the county and a teacher in Jefferson County Public Schools. In recent statements to the Jefferson County Commission, Nick Deal has stated that the Jefferson County Development Authority is, quote, no longer in the Rockwool business, end quote, and that he is being mischaracterized and misrepresented as running a rogue organization without governance or oversight. I'm not here to debate about a person who oddly suggested children should monitor the toxic emissions from heavy industry as a science project and who called residents with serious and legitimate concerns about risks posed by the Rockwool factory to our air, water, and economy, quote, hysterical. I'm here to state that the Jefferson County Development Authority needs to move in a completely different direction and that the JCC, you all, must appoint a board that can provide that direction to the Development Authority's Executive Committee and staff. The obsolete, long discredited model of economic development pursued by the old JCDA must be abandoned. The world is moving to a low emissions economy and Jefferson County has the opportunity to lead the way. Under the current and previous executive directors, the Development Authority oriented our economic development programs toward Charleston's philosophy of government handouts and international marketing programs designed to attract industry not wanted anywhere else. In light of Commissioner Nolan's embarrassing and puzzling defense of air pollution in the Martinsburg Journal, we have little faith that the County Commission will provide adequate oversight of the Development Authority, making the prompt appointment of a qualified, forward-thinking board even more urgent. Thank you. Lawrence <laughs> I'm Lars Prilliman. I'm a local farmer, and I grew up in Middleway. I would like to bring to your attention the Hamilton Project's Vitality Index which measures a county's economic well-being on a scale between one and negative one. It combines median household income, poverty rate, unemployment rate, prime age employment rate, life expectancy, and housing vacancy rate. Jefferson County has a vitality score of .5031. That's our county. The entire state of Virginia has an average score of .6756, slightly higher than Jefferson County. The entire state of West Virginia has a vitality score of negative .9736, about as bad as you can get. We must abandon the current trajectory of heavy industry and move forward toward a clean economy future. It is not enough for the JCDA to state that it is out of the rock wool business when it is spending money on lawyers in order to keep its dealings secret from the public. The JCDA must join the people of Jefferson County in rejecting rock wool and rejecting heavy industry. It must actively work with us to negate the pilot agreement and send Rockwell home. Additionally, the JCDA must not waste any more taxpayer money on pilot agreements for polluters. The fact that the JCDA is still working to give incentives to a foreign corporation, TEMA, after the company is already committed to a location shows the bankruptcy of this organization. The JCDA must halt all activities until a new board is convened. That board must pursue an enlightened, forward-thinking policy that builds on our strengths as a historic county with an educated workforce and profound natural beauty. Finally, the Jefferson County Commission must stop its attempts to manipulate the outcomes, and it must also join the people of Jefferson County in pursuing a better course for our economy, our children, and our future. Thank you. Good evening, Commission. Uh, my name is Tracy Cannon. Thank you for listening to your constituents this evening. 
Back, back in December of last year, many of us here tonight asked the DEP, the West Virginia Department of Environmental Protection, for a local public hearing on the permit for the pipeline to Rockwall. Our new delegates, John Doyle and Sammy Brown, requested the hearing on behalf of their constituents. On January 25th, due to the high level of public interest, a notice about the hearing appeared in the journal. The hearing was to be held on February 21st at the Ranson Civic Center. At another DEP hearing at that same Civic Center on January 30th, a DEP official told a group of us that the hearing would need to be rescheduled due to a conflict at that location. Over the next uh, several weeks, I stayed in contact with the DEP to find out when the new date would be. I got a persistent runaround treatment until March 5th when a DEP official admitted the reason why the hearing had not been rescheduled. This official told me that they said they can't guarantee our safety, implying that someone associated with the location, the Ranson Civic Center, had claimed that those of us wanting to attend the hearing were some sort of threat to the DEP officials. Those same officials had just been to the January 30th hearing, as well as the December 10th hearing at that location where no incidents whatsoever had taken place. The statement about the DEP officials' safety being somehow in doubt is frankly slanderous. Slander is defined as making false and damaging statements about someone. The people sitting in this room have been slandered by whichever Ranson official made this claim. First, it is a false statement. There is no reason to believe, based on past experience, that we put, we, all of us here in this room, would put the DEP officials in any danger whatsoever. And the statement has been damaging to us in that we have not been able to get a public hearing based on that statement being told to the DEP. I ask that the Jefferson County Commission please write a letter to the DEP informing the agency that Jefferson County citizens opposed to the pipeline are peaceful and law-abiding citizens who present no threat to them. I ask that the Commission also request a local public hearing on the pipeline extension. And while the Commission is at it, I would also ask you to please ask Ranson officials to cease making slanderous statements about us, your constituents. Thank you very much. I want to say thank you for hearing us, first of all. And I want to say thank you to the commissioners for extending the public comment to 30 minutes. Uh, we as citizens have been greatly affected by the thought of heavy industry coming into the area. We have had many sleepless nights. Our children are also greatly impacted. I hear from other parents that their 11-year-old is greatly worried every day at school. Is Rockwell coming? Kids shouldn't have to worry about heavy industry coming. Our children are already being greatly impacted in our community. And I think we deserve the right to be heard. And I appreciate that. I've been here 40 years. I don't care when you just moved here yesterday. You deserve. You're a, you're a citizen of the United States of America. And we need and we should be heard. And obviously we haven't been. These teddy bears again represent our children who are not here. But they are here. They are in our families. They are your families. You should think about the children. Why is this going across the street? from an elementary school 
and in close proximity to so many of our children when you couldn't build a new school in the same location. That makes absolutely no sense to anybody. Why has this happened? Are you guys deaf? I mean, I really wonder, why is this happening? When I've talked to so many people, they go, the first thing they go, well, why is this happening? They're perplexed. And then the next thing they do, you know what they do? They go, it must be for money. And that's it. Our children, our community are being sold out to heavy industry. It isn't just my thought. It's everybody that I've talked to. Those are the spirits. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said, I think that um, we do not need heavy industry in, in our county. And I'll tell you, the Danish government and the Danes know clear well through their research that this kills people and causes autism. It's the Danish's own recent studies that it causes autism. So aren't our children as important as the Danish children? I think so. So why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? Thank you for listening. I hope you are listening. Time for one more, David Tabbs. David Tabb, Jefferson County resident. I just handed you what had already been served on your office, a four-year request for the team of pilot agreement, which has been denied the request of several people within the audience. Also uh, requesting that the, uh, under Freedom of Information Act, the requirement of a, the manual checks that have been going on since uh, 2017, 2018 physical year and 2019 and 20, up to 2019 to date. Uh, where this money uh, came from, who it was given to, what accounts it were going to, and was it a budget related item and how can you do a manual check. Now, the other issues here this evening is that one of the commissioners, Commissioner Tab, said that she had not been involved in any lawsuits. Well, let me tell you something. My constitutional rights were taken away by three people that are sitting here at this county commission right now. Took my constitutional rights away and said I cannot defend myself in a court of law. Then, Commissioner Tabb sued me, me personally, to clear up a clarification on the ambulance fee. Now, you had a clear opportunity to take me to task and you chose to deny me a day in court. The judge ordered it. Then you retract it. What do you call that? That is sad. Really sad. And the rest of the people have no clue what you've been putting me through for the last 14 years. They're starting to understand. Parks and Recs is not required to be funded at all. If you want to, you can. If you have the money, you don't have the money. Yet, you fund them and ignore the fire companies. Emergency services are required by law. The tax office, what in the heck do you call that? And you turn your head when you walk by the window down there. I will not pay my taxes anymore until I have a suitable place to pay my taxes, which I'm accustomed to, period. You have an increase in fuel that you've going to budget. What about the fire companies? They also have an increase in fuel. But yet you deny them, you're going to cut their, their uh, funding. Paper mill. Does anyone know that they switched over from coal to propane? Does anyone know that other than me? Unbelievable. So it went from 18 pounds to almost zero emissions, but yet we're going to allow something to happen some four miles away to pollute us. Y'all have you. a nice day. Great. We move on to presentations, and the sheriff is first. Ma'am, I would have signed up earlier. 
except I was helping this 97-year-old woman sit and make sure that she was safe, and I appreciate it if you could make an exception to policy and listen to my three minutes. Um, if I listen to you, I have to listen to everyone else no, on the no, list, no. and no, I think no. and I no. think we're, we're going to move on to the agenda. Will we be at the end of the agenda? <laughs> no. When are we going to be heard? I need to know that because I plan these things, I write these speeches, I expect to talk to you, and then you say no. Okay, so what, what's it going to be? Just when you decide no? Well, it's on the agenda. And we gave you 10 extra minutes this evening. No, you didn't. You gave minutes. Well, no, we were, we were scheduled for 20 minutes. We increased that to 30 minutes. We're so going to move on with the agenda. Ma'am, and you know that. Thank you. We are the people that you're supposed to be listening to, and Mr. that Mansfield, is the problem. You can be seated or you can leave. All the people should be heard. All the people should all be heard. Yeah, all of us. Every one of us. And it shouldn't be three minutes. You're it should be great. until you get sick and tired of hearing us. I, I was under the assumption that you added 10 minutes to the beginning and everybody else at the end after no. you did normal business was going to be allowed to talk. That's why I said, and that's we, why. We're not doing that, Josh. Well, Unless I, I other fully commissioners support it. want to do that. I want to do it. We're not going to do that. Make a motion. I move we extend public comment indefinitely after all the normal business has occurred. Second. Okay. Is there discussion? Okay. Hearing the hearing that, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. Okay, it's four to one. We'll hear you at the end of the at the end of the uh, meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, and uh, in the spirit of the comment, I will be very brief. Um, I am here tonight about a uh, court security grant agreement. This is a no match uh, agreement. Uh, <coughs> As, we, as you know, we always try to get the best value for our money. Uh, this agreement is, or this grant request is to do several things. One is to put additional metal detectors. Uh, the metal detectors that we have in some of our buildings are not very reliable, and we need to do that. It also would give us some additional hand wands. Uh, we also would... Uh, there was a lot of discussion when the committee met about what to do because as those of you who come into that courthouse regularly know where the bailiff sits at this point, when the door opens, the sun glares right in their face. It's not a very safe place. We looked at various options, including one that would be a $46,000 uh, build out in front of the uh, existing courthouse, which uh, uh, for security purposes would be very nice. but cost-wise just seems ridiculous to me. I think uh, we could do a fix at about $650 to reconfigure where that doorway and the desk are and give enough space. We could actually increase the amount of space for people coming in and change that. And then the last part, which is fairly expensive, is $13,000. Uh, those of you who have been over in the judicial building, there are two major holding cells. There's also another holding cell that's there. We have looked this this week. We had a we had a case going on. We had several people who were incarcerated in the Eastern Regional Jail and other facilities. We had to keep them apart so they couldn't talk to each other. Uh, it was a sort of logistical nightmare. And so what we uh, are looking to do is to give us some temporary holding spaces because we literally had, I think, as many as six people we had to hold in different locations, which is both costly and, and not very safe. So altogether, this is a $19,219 fix on what would otherwise be probably closer to a $100,000 fix. So, Madam. One question. Yes. The ho temporary holding cells in which building would that be? It's in the judicial building. It's where the other holding cells are. The difference is this this is really not configured or it, it needs to be configured so we can hold people sort of temporarily in those in those. We actually think we could put two small single person holding facilities. These would be people just being held for like a couple of hours at a time. They wouldn't be held all day or that kind of thing. So are you going to split up the current holdings? Is, are oh, the current holding cells are going to stay just like they are. Mm -hmm. On the other side is another room that is really could be converted into a holding cell area. And so there's 
something else behind it, but we can configure a wall that will give us a holding cell area on the other side. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Um, um, members of the commission, I'm therefore asking that uh, you authorize the uh, commission president to uh, sign the grant agreement for $19,219. I so, I so move. Second. <laughs> it's been moved and seconded. Is there discussion? <coughs> Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Thank you. At the bottom. Yeah. There you go. All right. Next up is Deborah Young. Item number two on the agenda, and Deborah is the Jefferson County Victims Advocate. <laughs> it's just a small grant, right? <laughs> Maybe that's just a small grant. Um, that's the ritual. Big enough? Oh, okay. All right. So you are uh, here rest requesting your annual grant for the Victims of Crime uh, program. Yes. And so I'll let you explain it. Would you like to go first? No, go ahead. Okay. Deborah Young. Ladies first. Um, the coordinator for the Victim Assistance Program located in the Prosecuting Attorney's Office. Um, the Victim Assistance Program has been here for 21 years. Um, and here we are again, and it's grown quite a bit. Um, let me just give you some numbers, just so that you know. Um, during the year of 2017 to 2018, we served 885 new victims during that year, and as well as 1,800 ongoing victims. Um, that consisted of going to court with them, providing them with ser varying services, personal advocacy, keeping them notified of hearings, um, assisting them with the West Virginia Crime Victims Compensation Fund, and crisis counseling, and ongoing follow-up contacts. Um, what we're asking for this year is a little different. We currently have two full-time victim advocates that, that, that's funded through the grant as well as the county commission and a part-time advocate that is 100% VOCA funded. We are requesting the funding this year for another part-time victim advocate, which would be 100% funded by the grant and an increase of 10% in the amount that VOCA pays the uh, second victim advocate in her salary and in order to retain her. The bottom line yeah. is that it costs $531, $531 to increase and try to keep her. She's a highly, highly experienced woman, 13 years of experience working with um, in CPS, Child Protective <laughs> Services, and she, um, we're very lucky to have her. So I'd like to keep her. So that is essentially it. It increases the grant to, we are requesting, VOCA funds $104,000 um, approximately. And the match for the county is 26,206, which comes from our salaries. So, so we are requesting your approval to send in the grant as it is. Okay. And, and, and I'm solely here just to, you know, I, I've said it many times in front of this commission about how important this program is to the Jefferson County community at large and, and to the office and the successes that we're having. For example, Ms. Young and uh, Ms. Hall spent all week, uh, we had a murder trial that consumed most of the week and they were there the whole time with the family coordinating witnesses and victims as well and um, they provide a lot of comfort to the people who need it. Um, the $531, we're not, I'm not seeking a, a budget revision, or I might be seeking a budget revision, but I'm not asking for additional monies. I will be able to find that within my current budget 
from last year and the one that I've already submitted for this year. Yeah, I, I was around when the program first started, so, and I've seen the good work that comes from it, and uh, it, it really is amazing what, you know, it's, uh, it's really very rewarding to see victims in the courtroom, and they're comforted by the victim's advocates, and it's, it's really a great program, and, and I'm glad that it's continuing. I'm a big supporter of it. I think it's a great program, and it's so needed. Yeah, a lot of people don't have the, you know, so many victims are, uh, it's hard. You know, it's hard for them to well, be able to scary. do what they do. It's, it's very process. scary. The court is very scary. So I appreciate it. So We have the current space available. Okay. And everything that we need as well. Let me just throw my two cents worth in. I, mm -hmm. I used to be the prosecutor, I think that you, Victims advocates do a great job. But Thank you. <clears throat> the victim advocates do a very good job, and sometimes it's just a simple matter of them walking over the prosecutor who has been negotiating a, a plea with the defendant and just going, Ralph, you haven't talked to the victim yet. And I, I think it's a very important job they do. Thank you. Yes, they're true, true advocates for the victim. They not here to tell the attorneys in the office what they want to hear. And they, they have carte blanche to free reign to do that, to bump us in the head when we need it. Great. Anyone else want to comment? Okay. I'll make the motion that we uh, approve uh, the Victims of Crime Act, the VOCA grant application, and have the president uh, sign, sign it. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. I'll sign. And I'll say it again. I think we have the best victims advocate program in the state. I, 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 I say it all the time. Every time I'm here. I agree with that. But, but this is the first time she's hearing me say it. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's great. <laughs> it's, it's a valuable. He does say it all the time. Though. Yeah. <laughs> He needs yeah. to say it more often, it, but it's, but it's nice just, that he said it here yes. tonight. Absolutely, yes. absolutely. This community should be proud of the work that they're doing. And here you go. I'll say. Congratulations on the work that you're doing. Thank you very much. Now, if we could only get a grant writer for the county. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Keep it in mind. Leave all your head. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Up next is uh, Roger Goodwin. Uh, he would have been number nine, but we're moving him ahead. Um, I see Roger in the back. And. Uh, it is number nine on the on the agenda. Hi, Roger. Hi there. At your meeting two weeks ago, uh, we um, discussed a proposed amendment to the impact fee procedures ordinance to amend it and specific to the impact fee um, discount under the affordable uh, housing discount section of the ordinance. And we were amending it to uh, clarify and provide um, a better incentive for developers to develop um, housing that would provide for, as required under state code, housing for low and moderate income persons, persons on fixed incomes, the elderly and persons with special needs, um, since they're not able to obtain safe, decent, and affordable housing. So we proposed that amendment, you held a public hearing, and then you decided to hold the hearing open for two weeks for written comment, and we've received no written comment. I think the normal procedure is um, to then close the public hearing if you desire, and then take action however you want to. And we did. We had held it open for two weeks, and uh, so today marks the end of that two weeks, so we're ready to uh, take action on the amendment and uh, so I'll I'll make the motion to uh, move to amend the affordable housing discount um, 
portion of the impact fee ordinance uh, as uh, provided in section 2F uh, and it's pages uh, 19 and 20 of the impact fee ordinance. And if I would speak, I yes. would ask that, that if it's adopted, it be effective on the first day of June 2019. And to make it effective on June? Pardon? June or July. We can do it as early as June. Okay. <laughs> make it effective June 1. So I'll just add that to the motion. I'll second the motion. There, uh, a discussion? I guess it's a question, Roger. I realize this is all government paperwork and things. But how does one know if this works? Uh, we had that discussion. We lowered the um, percentage that of the. Uh, well, I, I realize that, but a year from now, or two years from now, how do you know? Is there somebody that comes in from the feds and audits you somehow? I, I'm just want to make sure we somewhere down the road we don't get in trouble. No, we're not involved with the federal government. This is under state code. And it's kind of a trial and error thing. Um, we know that the, the threshold that we set it at originally allows for an apartment complex to get the discount, but it's not uh, providing housing, we don't believe, for this demographic side in the state code. So we've lowered it, and when the next one comes in that's, that qualifies, we'll see how that ends up. And, and uh, we may have to play with it again a little bit. But uh, there, it, uh, the federal government won't be an issue on this. Just, just one thing on that. Just so everybody's clear of what this actually is. Okay, so a couple apartments were built in a section of the county, I think it was maybe Ranson, was it? Yeah. And those apartments were supposedly affordable housing, but it turns out that they actually weren't when you looked at what the rents turned out to be. So what the commission is doing now is lowering the threshold so the developers previously used it to their advantage, it looked like. We're trying to mitigate that so it doesn't happen again. We just haven't found the correct threshold and we think this is a good start. So we're working to fix the problem. So that people who want to uh, want to uh, live in, who can afford affordable, ha I mean, can who want a home at least have an option and they, this makes it more affordable for them to be able to rent their homes. So because this applies to apartment buildings and multi-unit dwellings. So, okay, anything else, Roger? Did we vote? I don't no. think so. No, okay, we haven't voted. So, uh, all in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank, Thank you. you. All right, up next, item number three, Effie Callis with the League of Women Voters. Um, and it looks like, yep, Lynn and Effie, come on down. Take one and pass. Commission. Thank you for hearing us tonight. What I've passed out is what I'll be presenting this evening. Just to let you know, um, the League of Women Voters has started a major new initiative that we want to speak with you about and ask for your support and assistance. Over the next several months, the League will study how our local governmental boards and commissions implement the West Virginia Open Governmental Meetings Act. Our own Lyd Widmeyer, here with me this evening, is coordinating this rather large project. Our study entails two parts, an educational component and an informational gathering component. We're going to begin with the educational component with a presentation by the West Virginia Ethics Commission. We've invited Derek Comp, staff attorney with the Ethics Commission, to come and speak about the goals of the Act and the specific provisions of the Act as they relate to our local governmental bodies. The presentation has already been scheduled and it will be held on Wednesday, April the 10th at 7 o'clock here at Charles Washington Hall, free and open to the public. We invite you and all county boards and commissions to attend this presentation. We'll also be inviting all of the municipalities and their stakeholders to also attend. And in truth, we hope that you'll encourage all of the public officials appointed as well as elected to attend this presentation. The second component of the study, the informational gathering segment, is composed of a survey, survey and a follow-up personal interview with our local governmental bodies. The survey is a written questionnaire that our league has created, although it closely adheres to the Ethics Commission's open meeting checklist with which you are all familiar, I'm sure. We'll send this questionnaire to all of our local boards and commissions regarding their compliance with the Open Meetings Act. We don't anticipate 
anything outside of the act. But it's um, in terms of moving on to the next section. Thereafter, we plan to conduct interviews with each of the entities. And the interviews are really ge geared toward two things. Assessing what and can should be done on the local level to increase public awareness and participation and assessing what changes can or should be done at the state level to bring the West Virginia Open Meetings Act into the 21st century. I believe the last time that act was amendment, amended was 1990, so maybe 30 years. It's time to take a look at a few things. We are working in a vastly different world. The League of Women Voters of Jefferson County is excited about this study, looks forward to your participation and the participation of all the decision makers and the public, and I believe that we have on the agenda a recommended motion. Do you have that in front of you? Yeah. We did. Yes. I'm requesting that the Jefferson County Commission encourage all members of the boards, commissions, and authorities, and their staff to attend the April 10 presentation by the Ethics Commission and to participate in the upcoming league study relating to the Open Meetings Act. Well, I'm, I'm glad you're doing this because the county likes to, we like to um, provide training um, once a year. Uh, to boards, commissions, elected officials uh, with regards to the Ethics Act. And it ha since it hasn't been changed in about 30 years, uh, it's time that they do look at it again and hopefully they'll make some positive changes to it. So We've spoken to uh, the other um, League of Women Voters. There's several throughout the state. And when we told them that we're going to institute, that they were highly interested because they too were in counties where it's like, there are dif difficult issues, and this Open Meetings Act perhaps needs to move with the times. Um, yeah, I appreciate you. I appreciate this. This is this is good. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other comments from commissioners? Okay. Well, I'll uh, move um, that the commission encourage all members of boards, commissions, authorities, and their staff to attend the April 10th presentation by the West Virginia Ethics Commission and to participate in the upcoming League of Women Voters study relating to the Open uh, Meetings Act. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there discussion? Okay. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Nick Deal? Is Nick here? Okay. Good evening. Hi there. Uh, can I make one comment before Mr. Deals gets started? Um, I know there's been concern about the public that this is a revised agenda and the League of Women Voters and um, the Development Authority was added the day, I think the day after the original agenda was posted. And um, I've reviewed my Open Meetings Act right here in my notebook all the time. And that is permitted, uh, the agenda may be amended up to two business days before the meeting. And I feel that we've met that requirement. So. I'm gonna uh, pass right, just our, our P&Ls to date, just so you got it. Okay. These are available to the public somewhere? Well, I mean, they, they can request them. Uh, they, they have not been ratified by the board, and so the Obvious board's going to have to approve a whole bunch of stuff when we have a new board. So, so, where, where will they be available, I guess, when they're on, on our website, as soon as the board approves them. But, um, and I know it's only been a couple weeks, but I just wanted to, yeah, to give you those. Yeah. Those here. Um, I, um, as you all know, I started here in uh, November of 2017 and <clears throat> one of the first things I was told when I started here was that we needed to uh, wrap up the uh, team of pilot agreement but we couldn't really do that until we knew what the actual costs were going to be. Um, I think at that time John Reismuber, uh in the fall of 2017 had, uh, had discussed that and, and talked about the pilot agreement and had some general ideas on um, what they were going to do with that. And um, so that's where we are now. The building's done. The <coughs> excuse me. 
the building's done, the, um, the equipment's there, and so we need to um, decide what we're going to do with this, with this pilot agreement at this time. I guess my only issue is, is if, I'm not voting on anything until that pilot agreement has been somewhat released in some sort of draft form or something. I understand things need to be updated or changed or whatever. I think we owe it to the people to give them some sort of general understanding if possible. If there's any clarification that, that can be made That is completely up to you all. Well, if, if I could weigh in on that, I believe that the reason that it has not been released to this point is because it is still a document in progress. If the commission, you know, reviews it, and, and I am going to uh, suggest that we go into an executive session so I can discuss a couple of things with you, especially since um, my sense of um, the hearing so far tonight has been that there may be litigation threat and there may be liability issues. But additionally, um, if the commission reviews the document and approves it, then um, you know it, it is more like a final draft. But it's very. Com but if it's approved, then it's not a final draft. It's a final. Well, I'm I'm not saying approve it in the sense of signing it, but if if the commission were to. Verify but we agree to terms, but not. Yes, right. that's right. But it is, it is an absolute nightmare to release a draft document and then make changes. And then there are a bunch of people with the original document and version two, version three, or whatever it is. Everyone is commenting on the wrong version when the final document uh, may be different. And so it's just a, as a very practical reason, um, it's not it's not good to release that document while it is still a work in progress, which I believe at this point it still is. Now, you know, what you do tonight may change that, and, and you know, that's, that may put a different spin on what you want to do, but I believe the reason it has not been released at this point um, is because it is still a work in progress. I mean, is there any way to release a fact sheet of what may or may not be part of it? Or I'm just trying to do something within the legal realm of reason, but also suffices to the public. I understand, and keep in mind, Nathan is a lawyer. He is, nothing is to be pushed against him whatsoever. He's just giving us the facts as the facts are. Same thing with everybody else right here. So I mean, we're trying to, I'm trying to find a balancing act here that suffices the legality of the situation and also gives the public the information they deserve. And again, I think if we, um, if we if we met in an executive session to review a couple of the issues, then you know you may want to revisit that question. Okay, but um, as of right at this moment, it seems to me to be a document in progress. So we need to go into executive session to discuss the uh, to discuss. The that would be in terms of the pilot agreement. Well, and, and my recommendation is I have some issues that I would like to discuss with you regarding liability issues uh, that I believe that the commission needs to hear, and um, and then and also you know to review the agreement uh, for a bit, and then um, um, you know then you, the commission can make a decision about what it wants to do. Well, I've I've got concerns too, and I I I I suppose I should run them through legal counsel first, but um, I'm hoping there'll be portions of that that can be said in public, and we'll f figure that out in these. And that'll be entirely in executive session. I have to say, I've been out to Mr. Deal's office. Primarily, we talked about Rockwell. He did tell me about five minutes about Tima. Be honest with you. All all I remember is something about plastic pellets and whatever. Could you give a f at least a five-minute rundown of what we're talking about, FEMA? Sure. Our team, um, FEMA. Yeah, and actually, I'll, I'll start by um, reading off a few company <laughs> names to you because I did hear some of the comments earlier. Um, Food Lion, Holiday Inn, 7-Eleven, Burger King, Aldi's, Budweiser, all GE, Ben and Jerry's. These are all foreknown companies, and so. Um, 
we have about two dozen foreign owned companies that I work with in Jefferson County. So I, you know, I don't want to give you the impression that <coughs> a company that is not, that is not headquartered in the United States is going to somehow not be forthcoming or, or not be um, as, in, as environmentally friendly and as community friendly as they can possibly be because that's just simply not the case. We have seen over and over again that uh, international companies uh, work very well in Jefferson County. Um, that being said, TEMA is owned by IWIS Holdings. They, have, uh, they sell products in 70 countries. They do primarily building materials. Um, they have uh, 14 factories. Um, they, if you're familiar with the, like they call them live roofs. So if you have a, a roof that you grow grass on or flowers on, well, you can't just put dirt on your roof. You have to actually put something down first. And so Tima makes that product that you can put down on your roof that you put the dirt in and things and it holds the dirt in so that you can grow grass on there, which is obviously much more environmentally friendly than using asphalt shingles. Um, one of the other things that they do is, is they make, <coughs> excuse me, they make, um, the riprap stuff that holds holds dirt in things for erosion purposes. Um, they use 100% recycled plastic in everything that they do, and um, they uh, they have, gosh, they have over a hundred different different building materials that they use. They also make the the framework. If you've ever tried to tile your own tub uh, or put in a shower or whatever, they uh, and and you you put up green board to do that typically. And they make a, a product that you can put up that is completely impervious to water. It does not shrink or, or expand with, with temperature. Um, and you, you basically just frame up a shower. And so they do, they make, they make that sort of thing. Hardy backer and board? Do what? Hardy backer board is it? It's actually, it's, it's, a, it's a plastic composite. It's made out of recycled plastic. But it, it's able to hold a spackle for, the, for tiles. And so... Um, and then they make some. They make a bunch of other products. Again, all out of recycled plastic. That roof thing is interesting because eventually the county's going to need new buildings. I mean, if they could somehow help out with that, we can incorporate some sort of green. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying put the whole roof. Jane, <laughs> Jane looks so at me like a, Jane's like, oh my yeah. gosh. <laughs> and I'm, I'm sure that they would. Interesting work. concept. I know Montgomery County, Maryland, did that at some parts of their uh, county-owned facilities. It's just an interesting concept that they actually do stuff like that. So yeah, it's well, and a lot of European countries have done this sort of thing for years, and they are, um, and they know it saves in heating costs, and uh, it also it's pretty, and so um, you know, it's, Tima is a is a company that looks for, you know, looks for those kinds of opportunities to make material building materials that are going to be environmentally friendly, and they're going to be, going to be able to uh, help, you know, help the environment. So the farmer on the commission looked at me like I was crazy. <laughs> well, I was just in, uh, looking at a green roof between the historic courthouse and the Hunter House, and I was like, uh, I don't know, but, you know, I'm up for anything uh, like that. Uh, it has we've, some flat roofs. It might work yeah, up there. Yeah, right. Well, you've got to be able to um, support the load, and you've got to have enough topsoil. We've done some of these. Uh, up in Berkeley County and Morgan County, green living roofs, so they are interesting, but they need maintenance. Yeah. <laughs> you, mow the, you have to mow the grass once it starts. <laughs> <laughs> but you could grow a lot of Johnson grass, I'll tell you. Yes, yeah. Input from Bill on that. <laughs> exactly. Any there'll other be, questions, Ryan? Um, water be or sewer, what, how's that work? Uh, they have public water and public sewer. They have a closed uh, system for their manufacturing, so they don't, no, none of their production water ever leaves the facility. No votes or anything for you all on that, I assume. The, um, they, uh, they'll have about 30 employees. Um, they, uh, will, their building is beautiful and the, the, the whole plant is very nicely done. Uh, and super, super nice people to work with. I, I, and they're actually one of, they're one of 31 uh, businesses that are in our stormwater management area. And um, we, as, as some of you probably know, the, our stormwater management system was, was way overbuilt. It was built for about 110 buildings, and we've only got 31. And so it's nowhere near capacity. Um, TEMA is the, I think they're, 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 they're I would call them a mid-sized building in the park. There are, you know, there's over a dozen buildings that are significantly larger than they are, um, but they are, um, 
you know, they're all, they're all part of, of our stormwater management system. So. I have a question that I think can be asked now. Um, I was frankly surprised to see this TEMA pilot. Um, I wasn't aware that these were done once the building was ready to be operational. So what is different oh. about this compared to other pilots that occur earlier in the process? Well, there are a few oddities, I'll call them, with this process. First of all, if you all recall, the state of West Virginia announced TEMA way before we, I say we as in JCDA and the county commission, was ready to announce the project. And so we were rushed in what we were doing with that. But that being said, as part of their incentive package to come here, uh, there, there was a uh, pilot agreement as part of that. Um, and that was, that was discussed in Oct on October 5th uh, with the county commission, uh, I, I, albeit briefly, but there were uh, some, there are some numbers out there that we can discuss. And um, it's a, I can tell you this, it is a very, very minimal pilot agreement as opposed to some, as opposed to the other one that you've seen. It's, um, it's pretty minuscule in the scheme of things. Well, I admit I don't have a perfect memory, but I don't recall hearing that, but that's, you know. Yeah, I, I knew that we, and I can't remember, we had been informed that there was another pilot agreement that was coming to us, okay. but it never came to us. So. Yeah, and, and the reason that it has taken so long for you actually to get the, the piece of paper is that TEMA was, was not sure exactly what the plant was, what they were going to, they weren't sure how many pieces of equipment they were going to have in there, and really up until the, the end they were still debating on uh, the, the size and shape of the building, and um, so we weren't sure what the cost was going to be. And so we couldn't really do that until all of that was done, and they just finalized some decisions on their uh, last piece of equipment just in the past couple months. So. Okay. Any other questions? All right. So uh, I move that we go into executive session to receive legal advice with regard to um, what well, to, to review the agreement and to uh, receive legal advice on a potential liability. Um, no, it is not. Um, it is not a the practice to say that you're going into executive session because we don't know if we are or not. You all are deciding that right now, and so I thought that's what we were doing. I, I understand, yeah. but there's a, <coughs> there's a was a question I thought from Josh no, about did it need to be on exec uh, did the oh, executive sure. session need to be on the agenda I, I and no it does not second the motion and, and my biggest purpose will to get this document released uh, and some other questions that I have um, <coughs> that I, I feel I do need to listen to legal counsel and um, get some of my questions answered and get them back in the public forum so I'll go into the executive session. I second the motion, I mean. Okay. So uh, all in favor of going into executive session, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, we're in executive session. Mm -hmm. Raise them out. Go for it.